Hey everybody, JJ here and happy Friday. Uh, happy to be able to kick off another PCDIY uh, weekly live stream. So where you've got actually a pretty good chunk of stuff to talk about this week. Um, there's actually quite a number of new product announcements. We've got some cool updates um, and I don't know if we'll have necessarily time today to be able to go ahead and jump into the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. Normally, we love to be able to cover your guys' builds, uh, but there's just a few things that I have to go ahead and handle uh, shortly after this stream. Um, and that's also just a quick minor update. Uh, normally, we try to pull off these streams on a weekly basis, generally every Friday, for those of you guys that are first joining us uh, as of today uh, for these weekly uh, PC DIY streams. The best way to kind of know if uh, the stream is going to be happening is look out for the event reminder and notice on our pages, as well as within the PC DIY Facebook group. Um, but I do have to drop my dog off uh, for actually uh, radiation therapy next week. So I might not necessarily be in um, next Friday to be able to go ahead and execute this stream. So if that ends up happening, I uh, will let you guys know and uh, we'll go from there. But as always, make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned to the PCDIY Facebook group, of course, for the most consistent updates regarding any of the things that we're talking about right now, as well as any kind of recent announcements, teasers, updates, or anything along those lines when it comes to ASUS's component hardware. So um, hey, Jeff. Uh, thanks for joining us here in the stream. Happy to be here, man, uh, and happy to have you here. So uh, let's first go ahead and just jump into a couple of general recaps of things that we're going to be talking about. We've actually got uh, quite a number of new updates uh, for this week. So first off, we're going to be talking a little bit about just some teasers uh, for some upcoming X570 refresh series motherboards. So that's going to be one little bit of announcement. Another one is going to be a general availability announcement in regards to our Claymore 2. Uh, so this guy right here, our brand new wireless uh, 10 key. 10 keyless and 10 key base keyboard. It's an interesting base design. And of course the Gladius 3. Um, and then we're also gonna be touching on two brand new monitors. Uh, we've got an ultra wide, an ROG Strix XG series monitor and a high end PA uh, Pro Art series monitor they're gonna be talking about. Two brand new Wi-Fi 6 ROG gaming routers that we're gonna be touching on a little bit. Um, a brand new mini PC featuring AMD's uh, 5000 new series uh, processors. And I think that'll probably get us covered for most of the hardware updates that we have. There might be maybe one surprise or two that I might jump into because I just got something. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this guy, but we've got a full stream coming up for refresh AIO coolers. But uh, for some of you that know, you know what this is. is. Um, but anyways, we, we, won't, we won't get into that as of yet. Um, so let's go ahead and get ready to jump into this here in a moment, and uh, we'll kind of go from there, guys. So uh, first things first, let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, some general UEFI updates. Um, so... Uh, I've gone ahead and posted the UEFI updates as of today for the PCDI Facebook group. I have not done that yet for the uh, Intel or AMD subreddits. Um, FYI, there's no AMD updates for the last seven days, so there's nothing to report for AMD-based motherboards in that regard. Uh, for the Intel-based updates that we went ahead and released, most of them are not going to be for, I think, enthusiast-level chipsets. So if you're kind of running any kind of the newer generation uh, Z590 series motherboards or anything like that, you don't necessarily need to worry about. Most of these updates were in relation to other kind of more entry or mid-range series chipsets like B8, uh, B series, H series, um, or actually SOC based Intel based chipset motherboards. Um, so if you actually want to see the entire list, make sure to go ahead and check out the PCDIY Facebook page and the announcement post that we have for all the available UEFI updates. And that will get you covered there. Um, so that is that. Um, and uh, just as a general, general FYI, some people kind of always ask about, you know, what if my motherboard isn't listed? Um, the thing that's most important to keep in mind is that depending on when you're kind of aware of what we're talking about in relation to a UEFI update when it's come out, is that you might not be accounting for the fact that UEFI release may have already recently come out for your motherboard. Um, so this is why I recommend that you actually kind of follow us in the group because you can see week to week when we release any updates. Uh, but if you haven't, just make sure to go to support.asus.com, put in your model number, uh, excuse me, uh, your product number as far as for your motherboard, and you can go ahead and check directly the UEFI page and see if there's been an available listing. Uh, some people kind of wonder, well, how long do UEFIs get generally released for a motherboard? And it varies. Um, you know, on average, I would probably say in most cases, you're generally going to find most motherboards are going to be supported somewhere between about probably 12 to as much as 24 months that you'll generally see some form of fairly consistent UEFI releases. Um, this can range from anywhere from probably like 10 to upwards of over 20 UEFI releases in that time and some Sometimes even more than that. Um, but it, it kind of depends on multiple factors. Um, the other kind of important thing to keep in mind is just because you see a UEFI update for one board doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be always applicable for your board. Um, the only time that that may be applicable will be for like larger specialized updates, things that include like a CPU microcode for Intel or uh, GISA based updates from AMD. Uh, and those like, are generally going to be more blanketed across like an entire series. So you would see those generally available for like all AMD series motherboards within a respective chipset and things along those lines. Okay, guys. 
So that covers that. Hey, uh, I think, is that uh, Al? Ali? Uh, hey, man. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us all the way from Turkey, man. Happy to have you here. Fantastic to always have uh, any of our RG enthusiasts, wherever they might be across the world. Uh, you know, I've been with the company for just about 15 years, almost since the very beginning of ROG. So it's literally we had just one product, one motherboard. Um, and now, you know, what ROG and ROG Strix uh, really is kind of the benchmark when it comes to kind of gaming products across so many different types of areas, whether it's going to be, you know, laptops, keyboards, graphics cards, headsets. Um, you know, a wide range of components, um, you know, it's it's really been awesome to be able to see that evolve and it definitely wouldn't be uh, what it is without you guys in the community. So thank you guys so much for your support over the years. All right, guys. Um, so, oh, uh, so hey, Jesse, uh, you're actually asking about what keyboard is that in front of me? That is this guy right here. So we'll actually talk about that in a moment. That is going to be this one right here, the brand new ROG Claymore 2. So this we actually announced at the beginning of the year and CES. And uh, the thing that really makes this special is this is an updated model to the original Claymore that came out in 2016. And kind of the really cool thing about this keyboard is, is that it is a TKL-based keyboard. But the real thing that's really kind of special about this is that it comes with this optional, essentially, numpad dock. So this allows you to go ahead and dock the numpad either on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So I can go ahead and pull it off, and I can put it on one side or the other so it's really nice it's flexible you can use this in a wired or wireless configuration uh, it's usb type c it has 2.4 gigahertz low latency wireless connectivity built into it and it also utilizes our brand new rog rx optical switches which uh, really offer an impressive level of performance and they better uh, offer a better illumination uh, better durability and reliability over the long term um, and they also have a very specialized design which actually i can show here if you're interested but the stem design actually allows there to be what's called less force deviation. And what I mean by force deviation is that generally, uh, when you go ahead and press something like uh, the corners of a switch, you're generally going to have a little bit of kind of wobble, and it, that might not necessarily always have a clean actuation or engagement of the actual switch. And because we're actually using a four-point stem with a specialized, uh, what we call X stabilizer, it's a stabilizer that goes like this underneath. It has a really clean uniformity across all four points that allow for a really consistent, um, essentially, key depression and a real big reduction in what we would essentially kind of refer to as key wobble. Um, so that is this kind, and I'll actually be talking about this in a moment, um, but it is now available on our ASUS eStore. It'll be coming out, uh, broader availability over the next coming weeks to, of course, more e-tailers. Um, so you'll be able to find that, you know, at places like Amazon and Newegg and other e-tailers. But right now you can go ahead and pick it up at the ASUS eStore, as well as this guy right here, the brand new Gladius 3, which is our brand new kind of a uh, high-end FPS centric mouse. And we're gonna have two versions of this, a wireless and a wired based version. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is exactly, if you saw this on uh, LTT, this is the same exact keyboard. Um, for some people that might wonder, some of the things that LTT didn't kind of go into that is I think kind of cool is that this also does have onboard memory profiles that are on here. So you can directly store things directly on the keyboard itself. It has hardware level controls for things like the lighting if you don't necessarily want to utilize um, the software. Um, there's also a really cool design in terms of a dual textured rubber finish on the base of the keyboard, which allows it to have actually really good adhesion so that when you press this down and you even try to move it, it does really adhere well to your surface area where in the prior generation, we also still had these type of uh, kind of, I I'd say, grip uh, material, but the grip material I'd say was a little bit slicker um, so that even if you kind of push on a little bit, it still moved a little bit. And so uh, there's been a lot of kind of subtle improvements that we've made. There's also uh, really big advancements in terms of the battery you'll find even compared to kind of other similar high-end wireless gaming keyboards that are on the market. Um, this will have a much, much longer battery life and also supports quick charging. And it has a USB-C, excuse me, um, USB-C connection and then also USB-A um, pass-through connection. And there's even a cool little magnetic dock to be able to store uh, the RF. Uh, so you can just pull that in and out. So this is really nice right here. So uh, let me go ahead and uh, just uh, give you guys actually some of these quick availability updates uh, for you guys. So uh, first things first, um, uh, pretty much what we actually just talked about right there, I would say is going to be the Claymore 2. So this is the actual Claymore 2. Um, so that's exactly what I've got right here. 
Um, now, this is going to be for the RX Red version. So that's essentially our linear version. It's an optical base switch. Um, really, really high performance. It really has a great feel to it, and I'm really a big fan of it. Um, actually, I actually can show you just a kind of little bit of a quick close-up here on the secondary cam if you guys kind of want to see some of the cool things right here. Uh, MSRP, as you see there, is 269 is available from the ACC store. We will have a tactile-based version. So for somebody that kind of wants a little bit more of a clicky version, like this one, this is not out yet. Um, this will be the RX tactile version in blues. Um, but this will be coming out a little bit closer in Q3 timeframe. Um, the other thing here, of course, you'll notice is that this does have a volume wheel right here. Um, let me actually go ahead and show you guys that in the... I'll go ahead and show you that, guys, on the secondary cam. Give me one second here to focus in on this. Adjust my lighting here. There we go. Okay, cool. So let me show you guys here. This is the actual numpad itself right here. So see, very nice. Here is the volume wheel. This works in two-step increments. So you can go ahead and adjust your volume. This is metal. And then you have four macro keys right here that you can go ahead and customize and tailor pretty much to whatever you're looking for uh, when it comes to making any type of you know on-the-fly adjustment. If you don't configure these, these will work as media keys. So things like um, you know play, pause, fast forward, things along those lines. And actually, I can show you a little bit here. If I pull this off, um, let me see if I can get this off here. But you can see actually right there, there's the four point stem and there is the LED, which is centrally mounted. Uh, and so that's quite a bit different than a traditional cherry based uh, switch. So this actually is what allows for the much kind of con more consistent um, cornered depression experience, uh, which is what uh, we've kind of tested. And like I said, it's called forced deviation. So that is your uh, numpad right there. So that is going to be, like I said, uh, the Claymore 2. Right now, it is available. You guys can check it out. Uh, the link has gone ahead and been dropped there in the chat. So next up, we've got another update for you guys, and that is going to be here with this guy. This is the Gladius 3 Wireless. Actually, I've got, I think, another one over here. Yep. Let me go ahead and pull this one over. Uh, so this is going to be here. This is a really high performance base optical mouse. We uh, had now gone ahead and launched this model right here. Um, this is going to be I think a great choice for those of you that are looking around all around kind of high performance space optical mouse, 19,000 DPI, has a specially tuned sensor that actually can go up to 26,000 DPI. It has our 100% PTFE omni feet based design. It is gonna use fully independent left and right switches. It has USB type C connectivity, but it also supports two other modes of connection. As you can see right here, there's no cable. And that is because this guy can support low latency 2.4 gigahertz wireless and also supports Bluetooth. And that's all done through a little just switch down here on the bottom. Uh, I can actually show you guys. So give me a second here. I'm going to show you what that looks like there. So you can see right there, here's our PTFE feet. That's the switch to allow you to go ahead and change the different modes. Uh, this is actually where you would be able to store the RF directly on board. Um, and here, this is the really cool part, is that you can go ahead and remove these to allow you to customize the switch. Many of you probably have seen this. This is not new if you guys watched our previous uh, live streams where we've shown you, but the real kind of really cool part about the Gladius is going to be that it does support customizable switch design. And so what you mean by that is, I can go ahead and just open this up and change out the switches. Now this comes with our high-end ROG micro switches, which are rated for 70 million clicks. They have uh, gold plating at the electrical junction, which helps to reduce oxidation and maximize lifespan. And they have very, very tight tolerance, better tolerances than your standard Omron switches. Um, they only have five, five, uh, five gram force deviation between the left and the right, where your standard is usually gonna be about 15. And so you can actually see right there, those are our ROG micro switches. Now, normally to customize or change out your switches, you would have to uh, desolder this and then resolder, but you can see I can literally pull out the switch. And then if I wanted to change this out, this is the real cool thing about the Gladius 3. It is exclusive. This is the only mouse on the market that offers this push fit based socket design, but you could actually go ahead and change out from a traditional mechanical switch and you could go with something like an Omron optical switch. So that is really, really sweet that you have that level of flexibility. And the cool part to that is then that means now, if you changed over to the optical switch, you could have an optical switch on your mouse, 
and you can have an optical switch on your keyboard to really be able to give you that uh, kind of amazing experience when it comes to the benefits that an optical mouse and an optical keyboard is gonna be able to give you, especially when it comes to performance. But um, I will tell you that one cool thing that we've also gone ahead and done is that it's really hard to see, but I uh, might be able to show you a little bit close up here. See if we get again tight here. But we actually have a specialized design right here. Uh, this is what we call a pivoted base design. And the pivoted base design actually helps to make direct contact with the top of the switch that little part right there, the plunger. And the reason why that's important is that that helps to create essentially a superior level of consistency when you're actually clicking the mouse and you're uh, clicking say, the button on the mouse. Um, and so that allows you to have far more consistent uh, depressions and executions ultimately. So um, really, really great design. And again, this model is also available um, and also has onboard memory profiles and also supports ASUS Aura um, control, including both wired and wireless sync operation. There's also a really kind of cool feature that we have for the Gladius 3, which is going to be what we call our hyperfire mode, which is a cool way to essentially allow you to um, have kind of pretty much automatic uh, melee or automatic single shot or semi uh, shot automation just by clicking the button once. But uh, when you input that in, uh, the actual kind of execution will be kind of in a rapid fire mechanic. So um, if you were kind of in a game where there's a lot of melee combat, instead of having to click this a lot of times to execute your melee, it would essentially allow you to just really execute melee super fast. Or if you were kind of shooting something like, again, like a single shot or like a semi-automatic, uh, then it would be able to actually execute that significantly faster. And that's a brand new feature that we've launched right now for the Gladius 3, uh, which is part of the Armory Crate software. There will be um, also a wired version of this coming out in the not too distant future, probably in Q3 timeframe. Uh, yeah, so somebody's asking actually about this guy, the PG32UQX. Uh, we actually have updated our product tracker um, inside the PCDIY Facebook group. That includes all the announced products that we have available and when they've come out. We've actually talked about this in previous PCDIY live streams, but the monitor is already started to be pushed out to the channel. So you'll start to actually show, start to see it show up kind of pretty much around the end of the month early next month. Um, it is a, a currently kind of available within a limited quantity. So it will kind of continue to improve over the next kind of coming weeks and coming months in terms of that availability. But you'll start to see it pop up uh, listed at more essentially e-tailers as we move into the beginning of next month. Um, and then kind of not too far off from that, oh, you'll also see kind of what some people refer to as kind of the little brother, the PG32UQ, which will essentially be the non-mini non LED version of that monitor uh, will be coming out in the not too distant future as well. So uh, definitely, if you're kind of looking for an end-all, be-all uh, monitor when it comes to an HDR experience, along with having that 4K, of course, that G-Sync-based technology and so many of the other cool features that that monitor uh, brings to the table, then you're definitely going to want to check out the PG32UQX. uqx All right. So that gives you guys an update on the Gladius 3. So again, um, I will give you guys the quick links right here. Gladius 3, wireless. It is available. You can pick it up in the Asus eStore. And then the ROG Claymore 2, which you can also go ahead and pick up in the ASUS eStore. Um, and I know some other people have kind of probably been wondering about, hey, uh, what about some of the other guys that you might have announced? And so again, we're going to have the Gladius 3 Wired, which is going to be coming out in the not too distant future. And we also have a much larger mouse with the ROG Spatha X, uh, which for those of you that love like kind of action RPG, MMOs are looking for a much bigger mouse, with multiple buttons, um, that's also going to be wired and wireless, then you're going to definitely want to check out that one. And that will be available sometime in Q3 timeframe. So that will be the ROG Spatha X. Okay. All right. So uh, let me see here. We talked about uh, Claymore, talked about Gladius 3. And now let's go ahead and jump into one of our first updates, which is going to be um, in the a new upcoming widescreen monitor. So yeah, let me go ahead and get this up and for you guys here. This is gonna be a pretty sweet monitor that we're gonna have available for you guys. So just go ahead and get the pictures loaded up here for it. This is gonna be the uh, new XG series monitor. 
So uh, the XG series is kind of like the series that's below our PG series. Um, PG series is generally kind of our highest end series. Those are kind of the RG Swift monitors. They're going to have the most advanced features and functions. But the RG Strix series is still very high performance, um, great ID design, really advanced specifications, but are going to be a little bit lower price point than what you're going to have in terms of the ROG uh, Swift series based monitors. So I know. Um, you know, there have been definitely a lot of people that have been interested and in wanting to be able to see if we're going to come out with anything new on the ultra wide side. Well, I'm excited right here to show it off to you guys. This is it right here. So this is the XG349C. This is our brand new 34 inch ultra wide QHD based monitor right here. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the shots. You'll also see right there that it is a curved based display. And it also, you can see, has a bit of our new kind of ID design where it's very blacked out, has a little bit of that RG branding, but is very, very clean. And it does have that undergo lighting, but the undergo lighting, of course, can be entirely uh, customized. So that's entirely up to you in terms of whether you want to have that enabled or disabled. So that is going to be the brand new XG349QC. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at some of the key specifications on this monitor. Um, now, as far as this is right now getting ready to roll out in terms of channel availability, so over the next coming weeks, as we move into the very beginning of June, second week of June, you'll probably start to see this actually show up in terms of overall availability. And the price point for this guy will be coming in at $899, OK? Uh, so Let's go ahead and uh, take a closer look at some of the core specifications for this monitor. So give me one second here. And we'll go ahead and open things up here. There we go. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and uh, see what we got here. So as we noted, this is a 34-inch base monitor. You can see it's 1340 by 1440. It will support up to 180 hertz, so very high refresh rate. That's a really great balance, especially you know if you're still on 60 hertz or even 120, 144. You can still see a nice bump up. But this really is a, a solid resolution to be, a, excuse me, solid resolution and refresh rate to really be able to experience across a wide range of games. One millisecond gray to gray. Um, it also supports our extreme low motion blur technology. This is essentially a technology that you can turn on um, that helps you to essentially improve motion clarity in certain games. Um, it's also got some really cool stuff in terms of USB-C connectivity and KVM functionality. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, very, very good color saturation performance and sRGB coverage. Um, G-Sync compatibility and display HDR 400. Now, for many people, kind of when they talk about kind of display HDR 400, they might kind of not see that as like an impressive specification because they might be thinking, well, for HDR, don't you need a much higher brightness? And um, that's definitely true. In a lot of cases, you are going to want even a higher level of brightness to really see HDR. But what the 400 spec means, though, I think for most users is that if you're coming over in terms of a monitor, in most situations, probably the monitor that you're running is probably going to be somewhere between 250 to maybe 300 nits. Having a monitor that can support 400 nits, regardless that it's going to be HDR, actually allows you to have kind of a punchier, more dynamic image and just overall a better color experience with more contrast. And so that, for me, just helps to give you a better, brighter display. And most people appreciate having a brighter display. So I think that is a, a kind of key benefit that you have, even though uh, you might not necessarily fully be able to ex really experience the value of what you would have compared to something like our PG32 UQX, a mini LED, which of course can considerably exceed over 1,000 nits, right? Um, so there you can see 34 inches, 3440 by 1440, uh, the one millisecond gray to gray response time, up to 180 hertz as times of the refresh rate, uh, G-Sync compatibility, so you can get that nice adaptive sync, so smooth, responsive gameplay experience. Now, this is the pretty cool part, is that um, it does actually have a USB-C hub that's built into it. So you can do a couple of things with this. One, it means that you could just connect directly something like your phone to the USB port that's on the monitor and have up to 18 watts power. Um, this also can actually serve uh, to actually have display output connectivity. So if you were to connect this to, like, let's say, a laptop, you could output the display signal as there. Um, now, the USB ports that are also on here can work in an upstream or downstream configuration. And that actually can allow you to have some cool functionality. So if you look right here, this is the cool functionality. So let's say if you had two separate devices connected to this and you had those ports enabled in the upstream, um, where the, the standard upstream connection on here is going to be a larger blockhead USB-A port, and then your other USB ports would be downstream. So those are like your hub ports. Um, but if you turn them in an upstream port and you were to connect something like you know, your keyboard or your mouse or your uh, you know, display or whatever it might be, then essentially you could turn this into like a hub type configuration, uh, excuse me, a KVM 
uh, configuration where you could have two systems, but they could have the same keyboard and mouse controlled on the same monitor. So it allows for much kind of cooler, cleaner uh, setup configuration. And that's pretty new. We haven't really offered uh, kind of this in the past. So that's a pretty cool level of functionality that you have there. Um, here you, of course, have the HDR. Um, it is important to note that, it, that we actually do have different HDR modes. Some people don't kind of realize that depending on the content that you're evaluating, sometimes you might want different kind of what are called uh, PQs. Uh, so these are kind of picture quality curves on optimization. So in our inside labs, um, we actually have done tuning to the actual HDR curves to try to maximize the performance in relation to either kind of video content or in terms of game content. And the reason why is that video tends to be mastered at, at a different HDR standard than you would have for, let's say, gaming content. Um, the actual also content representations are a bit different. So there are some kind of factors to keep in mind on why you would want to have like different presets um, so that if you did enable HDR, as opposed to, let's say, watching like Netflix in HDR, um, if you were to jump into like Cyberpunk and play it in HDR, you've got two different modes that you might want to leverage and utilize. You, of course, have all our cool um, on-screen options to be able to kind of maximize the experience when you're gaming. Shadow Boost to help you to go ahead and punch up those darker areas, especially great for kind of first-person shooters, darker survival-type games. Uh, game Plus gives you a lot of on-screen options for things like crosshairs, timers, things along those lines. Game Visual are essentially just a wide range of presets where we've tuned the monitor to kind of help to punch up sharpness or contrast or overdrive settings, different things like that. Um, some people kind of might throw these out the window and might not think that they're uh, valuable, but actually I can definitely tell you that I think that they can provide some nice experience improvements in different games. So like if, again, if I'm playing something like Cyberpunk as opposed to Forza, as opposed to Resident Evil, as opposed to, you know, Ori in the Blind Forest, I might actually find one of these presets actually might give me a little bit better overall experience in one of those. So it's worth actually you kind of trying it out. Okay. Um, and then the connectivity that we talked about, you can see right there, you've got HDMI 2.0, DisplayPort 1.4. Um, you've got your USB 3, uh, Type-A connection, USB-C, and a headphone port. Um, some people kind of wonder about the headphone port. It's actually kind of convenient to be able to have that, especially if you're kind of doing certain streaming type scenarios, depending on how you've got everything set up. It might actually be easier to have your audio routed through there, just connect your headphones to that, and you kind of be good to go. Um, this monitor also does have two watt speakers built into it. So for kind of basic things like watching like videos and streams and things like that, even listening to kind of some basic music, these speakers work. Uh, of course, your headphones or um, external speakers are going to be much better. But you know, uh, it's just having something that's built in, it's nice to be able to have that just kind of as a nice little backup or as an alternative option. And then you've got, of course, uh, really nice ergonomics uh, where, of course, you can fully adjust it. Uh, you can, of course, have swivel adjustment and tilt adjustment. Um, so a lot of flexibility. And of course, you can put this on a monitor arm through a Visa amount if that is something that you want. So overall, um, really cool monitor. And again, uh, like I said, it's uh, going to be coming in at a price point of $899. So that is going to be uh, the brand new XG349C. All right, guys. So um, let me go ahead to see if there's any questions of that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Quentin, uh, Quentin's actually asking about something cool that we had made an announcement back when we released uh, the kind of the world's fastest gaming monitor with our th ROG 360. So our 360 hertz monitor. There's actually a clamp di uh, clamp based mounting system that we do have. Um, and the monitor that essentially includes that has already been put out into the market, but we are looking to optionally sell that mount uh, for a wider range of our monitors. So the right now is still a little bit tentative, but we'll probably have a little bit more information for you guys coming for that in Q3. And thanks for that reminder, Quentin. If you want, feel free to go ahead and tag me in the group and I'll try to see if I can follow up with our PM team um, next week to be able to see if I can get a little bit more of a concrete timeline when we expect to see that accessory available, okay? Um, but definitely I agree that is a really cool option for those of you that are kind of looking for that. Um, hey, John, happy to have you here in the stream, man. Thanks for joining us and thanks for uh, being part of PC DIY uh, group here. So next up, we've got, um, you know how we just launched the PG32 UQX. So that is kind of a real end game monitor when it comes to HDR. Well, we've got another one and this is gonna be on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, and it's gonna really be for those of you that are professionals, you know, as part of the PC DIY kind of initiative, our goal isn't just about kind of having, I think products and talking about products that are great for, of course, our gaming enthusiasts, but also for prosumers, professionals, for creators, um, you know, people that are in advanced productivity because we have such a big portfolio of products. And so with our PA series of products, they're really tailored to those that are in that kind of prosumer and their professional space. And so the PA32UCG uh, uh, 
uh, dash K is really going to be kind of uh, the, the end all be all right now when it comes to a mini LED professionally kind of suited monitor um, with a display HDR um, standard uh, validation up to 1600 nits, sustained brightness of 1000 nits. Um, of course, it supports a Kalman verification. It has outstanding Delta E accuracy, uh, sub one. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of kind of specialized functions and features that have kind of really been built into this. So let's talk about this guy a little bit here and kind of jump into it. So uh, let me go ahead and just load up some of the images for this guy. So uh, this monitor, again, just like what we talked about with the XG, is going to be coming in the not too distant future. Um, and you know, generally with these announcements that we make here on the stream, you're usually your kind of time frame. It could be uh, from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. So I would start to be, uh, begin to expect to see kind of the listing availability of this probably sometime in late first week of June to maybe the second week of June. Okay. Um, so. Here you can see, um, of course, just beautiful, big 32 inch base display. Uh, you can also see that it includes a hood, which is great for handling things like reflections uh, in specialized environments, helping to maximize that you don't kind of have any type of color refraction or anything like that. Uh, there it is without the hood. And there you can see a little bit of an angle. So um, might not necessarily look, you know, too different, right? But it's really kind of what is underneath and what's inside this monitor that really is going to be special. So let's go ahead and actually, again, for this guy, take a closer look at its uh, kind of page and kind of review some of the key specifications uh, that are on this monitor. So give me a second here to actually load up this page for it. And I will do that. So give me one second here. Um, let's see, there we go. Okay, got it right here, guys. And the cool thing about this monitor is that it doesn't really just up the ante when it comes to uh, the experience when it comes to, of course, the mini LED technology, but it's also going to be the refresh rate. So traditionally, refresh rate hasn't been a specification that you've seen kind of, uh, I'd say, upgraded or kind of incorporate it into professional series displays. No situations, most of these are still gonna be 60 hertz based monitors, but that's where this monitor is kind of really unique. It's gonna be the world's first where you're incorporating the mini LED technology, um, high resolution, and also 120 hertz uh, support. So you can see 32 inches, 1600 nits, uh, over 1000, of course, zones right there for a full array local dimming. Um, that's gonna really help to give you, of course, that dynamic range that you're looking for and that contrast, of course, with reduction of things like blooming or haloing because you have essentially more targeted zones that you can dynamically essentially pull down and ramp up with in terms of the brightness values. 120 hertz in terms of the refresh rate support, um, official FreeSync uh, premium support, and Dolby Vision certification. Again, that's really kind of targeted towards the professionals, prosumers, uh, you know, uh, content creators, people that are working in professional color grading or they're working 3D modeling, animation, uh, maybe the medical field, science and simulation, of course, uh, game creation, um, you know, and of course, any type of video uh, content development as well. You can, of course, see uh, very outstanding color accuracy in terms of sub uh, Delta 1 E performance, uh, hardware level calibration that we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, Thunderbolt 3 integrated in there, and of course, Visa mount support. And, uh, you know, our work with Kalman in terms of being a partner to be able to support Kalman uh, validation and support as well as color space integration is all present there. And this is the other big one, HDMI 2.1 certification. This is still pretty rare. There's not too many monitors that are out that offer 2.1 certification support. Um, so that is going to be present here. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the other little things that are a little bit subtle here. Uh, one, this is a true 10-bit base panel. That's going to be important in terms of color gradation and color performance. The lookup table, though, will even be higher than 10 bits uh, to be able to give you really, really good color gradation. So that is an important point to keep in mind. Um, in terms of the connectivity, it's really rich. Even though you've got two Thunderbolt 3 ports on there, you still have four total USB ports on the rear, three Type-A ports and one Type-C port. So you've got kind of a really rich integrated hub that's on uh, the monitor there to be able to kind of connect a large array of devices on there. Uh, two HDMI ports that are on there as well. Um, and one of those being HDMI 2.1. So, and there's also this right here, which is going to be our ASUS off access contrast enhancement technology. And so we'll talk a little bit more about actually kind of what that does right here. So 
There we can see up to 1600 nits, 120 hertz, right? Those are the real big keenest T target specifications there. And uh, there is a lot of specialized cooling technology here to even be able to sustain, you know, a thousand nits in terms of brightness. So this will really be able to offer you a truly impressive HDR experience, whether you're, of course, gaming or you're a professional, um, you know, or maybe you're doing a little bit of both, right? Uh, but Generally for gamers, we would of course recommend you look at the PG32 UQX um, because that is really focused at gamers, okay? Um, here you can of course see some of the, kind of the targeted uh, users that we've talked about here. And uh, this right here is going to be a really key one, which is going to be this off-axis contrast optimization technology. And uh, the kind of the big thing here is, let me see if I can actually uh, copy this uh, URL here and uh, link it in here for you guys. Uh, but if you take a look at this video, what I actually find is the there's actually a layer. Um, if you're not kind of aware that most kind of monitors, they are actually multiple layers, including uh, something that's called like a polarizer that helps actually optimize the way that the actual LEDs um, kind of represent themselves in terms of the visibility. And you can do a lot of kind of tuning. It's very complex, but you can help to kind of reduce haloing and certain kind of other byproducts of the way that the actual emissions work uh, from the actual uh, LEDs themselves. And here, essentially, with this off-axis uh, contrast optimization, it's really allowed us to actually have in a very impressive level of performance. So um, here, if I go ahead and let's see, you can actually see maybe a little bit of it. Uh, but you'll see a little bit of kind of side-by-side -side comparison versus a monitor that doesn't have essentially the off-axis uh, contrast optimization and other ones that do. And this just really helps to maximize the benefit of having such a bright panel and a panel that also can really help to produce a, a darker, essentially a closer to kind of all black level of experience um, in terms of what you're seeing on the panel. So um, this is an exclusive technology that we have here on the ProArt series display. So pretty cool there. Um, multiple picture curves, uh, which are going to be very important. Again, kind of more suited towards professional creators where they're kind of understand the value adds of why this would be important. Um, our smart HDR technology, which helps you to kind of dynamically toggle uh, between different types of um, uh, HDR uh, validated standards. So you can see Dolby Vision, HLG, HDR10. Um, of course, high performance right here, 210 bit, 100%, 709, and 98% DCI-P3. The color accuracy. 120 hertz support. Um, this is going to be a cool one right here, this saved color parameter profile. So not, not a lot of people always realize, but if you do actually color calibration, the ICC profile for your colors is saved to your PC. So if you use this between different devices, so say something like a laptop and then like a desktop, your color profiles will actually be lost when you switch it from one device to another. Um, so actually a while back on some of our higher end PA series monitors, we built the actual IC into the monitor. That means you can actually store the calibration directly into the monitor. So even if you toggle back and forth between different devices, you can go ahead and maintain essentially your color accuracy between those devices. And you can also use our software to be able to go ahead and customize those elements um, kind of more easily and more flexibly. Keep in mind too, also PA series monitors have far more advanced color controls, including things like six color access controls, a lot of sub um, options that allow you to just be even more targeted and more precise with things like uh, hues and, and different things like that. Um, and here you can see just a round out for the connectivity, right? HDMI 2.1, 2.0, DisplayPort, Thunderbolt, and traditional USB connectivity. And ergonomics, you can see height adjustment, tilt, pivot, and swivel. So. That is going to be uh, this guy, the ultimately the PA32UCG-K. Uh, um, and that is going to be coming in at $499.99. So uh, essentially just about $5,000. So uh, again, um, definitely not going to be a monitor for everyone out there. But for those that are going to be really kind of professionals, have made the investment and in high performance, you know, cinematography equipment, professional workstations that are designed, like I said, for uh, medical science and simulation, uh, you know, animation, uh, content creation, anything like that, you know, this is really going to be the kind of the next generation of monitor that really take you through years in terms of really offering you kind of next generation specification support. So that is going to be that guy. So that's a big update that we have there. All right, guys. So let me just see here. Uh, next up, we've got... Uh, a cool little mini PC for you guys uh, that we're going to touch on. And then we've got two Wi-Fi 6 gaming uh, routers that are, are going to be an update. So next up here is going to be, let me go ahead and uh, load this up, is going to be the PN51. So um, if you guys aren't familiar, essentially, we do offer a wide range of mini PCs. 
Um, essentially, with these mini PCs, these are small, compact systems. You know, it's kind of like this is a, a fan. This is a 120 millimeter fan. You're talking about something that's literally dimensionally almost kind of the size of this fan, a little bit taller. Uh, maybe you know about two or three of these fans kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, but you can have a very high performance system within these, where you can use it, of course, as a general everyday system. You could use it like a NAS. Um, you could use it like uh, excuse me, like a media server. Um, there's a lot of flexibility you can have with these small form factor systems. They offer really good power efficiency, quiet level operation, but still rich level of connectivity and functionality. So this is going to be the uh, PN51. Uh, so this is gonna be an update to our prior generation. It's gonna be utilizing the new Ryzen 5000 U series processors that are based off of the Zen 2 architecture. Um, you can get it in either a four core variant or a six core variant. Um, six core means up to 12 threads, quite impressive. Um, you have those AMD based graphics on there would actually allow for pretty um, solid based, uh, you know, graphic gaming performance. You can play things like Battlefield 5 at 1080p, you know, medium settings, you know, uh, 50 frames a second. You can actually play Warzone on this. Um, you can play, of course, Fortnite, Apex Legends, Valorant, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Valhalla um, you know, where you know, as long as you kind of customize the settings, you can actually have a, a basic kind of gaming experience. And definitely if you're playing kind of more indie titles, a little bit older titles, those also run there as well. While this is definitely not a high-end gaming system by any stretch, um, you, you know, you definitely can have a, a good quality, you know, basic gaming experience on here. So it does offer some flexibility. And for video purposes, of course, the acceleration that you get there is also going to be solid. Um, so actually, let's stay there at the front. You can see that you've got your uh, 3.5 millimeter connection. You have a type C high speed connection type a you have two actually array based points there Which are microphones uh, micro SD which supports up to X SD XC based uh, memory class um, That's also there and your power button and there's also an IR um, IR implementation based in there as well for things like a remote control if you were to have something like that uh, You can incorporate and see side venting that's uh, present there in the design uh, more venting that's there on the side and this does uh, have rich connectivity on the back. You can see full-size display port. You have a USB-C, which supports display alt output, which means also you can support um, display port out connectivity. The LAN can, depending on the model that you look at, can be one gigabit or 2.5 gigabits LAN. It does also have Wi-Fi 6 um, part of that, along with the latest generation Bluetooth high-speed specification standard, so Bluetooth 5.0. Um, I think it's 5.1, um, and then USB uh, type A connectivity, and then your barrel power connection. And then you can also see on this model, we have what we call our flexible connection port. Um, so depending on the skew of the model, it comes with a different output configuration. And here you can see um, you've got essentially up to three display outputs. So that USB-C, which serves as a display port, so that would be one HDMI and then display port there. So a total of three display outputs. And here's the quick access to be able to go ahead and open the unit up and swap in essentially a storage based device. You can support high speed M.2 based SSDs in here, PCI Express, MDME, or traditional SATA. So uh, flexibility there. And there's uh, two DIMM slots, and you can also go ahead and upgrade the DIMMs on this guy too. And that's everything that comes inside the box, which you can see is the external power adapter and then also there the VESA mount. So let's go ahead and quickly just take a look at the uh, website uh, for this guy. So yeah, PN51. And again, uh, we'll be having this in a couple of different versions uh, with the PN51 coming again, like I said, in a four core variant or in a six core variant, just depends on the model. Um, like I noted there, it's the 5000, a U series processor. That's a mobile processor. It's I believe freighted for 15 watts. Um, comes with that integrated uh, AMD based graphics technology in there as well. Uh, based off the Zen 2 architecture, you can see you can support up to 64 gigabytes DDR4. Uh, M.2 based SSD has that Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.0 technology and supports dual USB 3.0 Gen 2. Um, type C connectivity there. Um, so some of the things that I kind of talked about that uh, were kind of cool, let's see here, was going to be the dual array microphone there, which is built in if you're going to take advantage of things like uh, Cortana uh, for kind of scheduling or maybe for things like, you know, calls or, um, you know, uh, meetings or things along those lines. Uh, that built-in card reader, which is a flexible way to add some additional storage if you wanted to be able to do something like that. And the dual storage design, which allows you to have that SATA and that M.2 based connectivity. So you can see very compact, easy to go ahead and set up. Uh, very solid performance, because like I said, you're working with Zen 2 architecture, a four core, eight thread or six core, 12 thread based part available to you. You can see very rich level of connectivity. You can run quite a bit of mo multiple monitors on here. 
Uh, you can see very compact in terms of the overall dimensions that you have on this unit. Uh, and then you can see right here in terms of just being able to uh, validate, we have done a lot of testing right there where you can actually see that we have carefully kind of designed the unit to be able to ensure good thermal operation, um, even under these kind of loads where you can see idle or 3D mark, um, or even with the actual boost mode technology enabled. And so even though you're getting something that's gonna be compact, you can feel confident in the temperature performance and the acoustics of this design. All the connectivity that we talked about right here, a lot of rich connectivity, and I think that 2.5 gigabits on there with also that Wi-Fi 6 is really, really nice. And here again, you can see a little bit in terms of the uh, fan duty cycle. And here, kind of the uh, this is kind of the important mode where you have multiple fan operating modes with different types of profiles. So a quiet mode or normal mode and performance mode. A lot of times in these kind of mini PCs, you don't generally, generally uh, have always, I think, an advanced level of type of UEFI with a little bit more kind of controller validation. So it's cool to be able to see those type of options. Um, this is also impressive here that if you kind of set this up as something like a little bit of a storage configuration uh, unit for your personal home environment, kind of like a media server or something like that. Nine watts at idle is really cool in terms of low power consumption. Even if you are utilizing it, you're not going to really be seeing a heavy level of power utilization from the unit. You know, even if you had like an LED white light bulb, you could probably be using more than that than you would be using for the system for that purpose if you had it connected to your network. And then uh, some nice options that are built in here within our supplemental software and, of course, within our UEFI. And lastly, you can see right here a lot of testing that we do from vibration to drop to port testing, temperature, humidity, noise test, um, and even kind of voltage compliance testing to be able to ensure kind of safety and reliability over the long term. So that is going to be the PN51. Uh, there will be kind of some revisions of this model as it kind of gets ready to roll out to the market, like I said, depending on the model that you're talking about um, and its configurations. So. Um, you're looking at either 349 uh, for the PN51, uh, for I think the four core model, yeah, and then 449 for the six core model. So like I said, you'll see these kind of showing up online um, as we kind of move over to the very end of May. And as we move into the beginning of June, you'll see them listing. And just, like I said, make sure to look at the specifications clearly in terms of which model you might be interested in terms of kind of those core specifications or those features. Okay. Very, very cool, guys. So that is going to be the PN51. All right. So uh, let me see here. Next, uh, we've got two new updates, which are going to be for routers. Um, so this is going to be for some Wi-Fi 6 routers. This is going to be, you know, I think a great choice that if you haven't upgraded yet to Wi-Fi 6, you're still running on Wi-Fi 5, but you've made an upgrade to, let's say, a laptop. You've got a new smartphone a new tablet, a new motherboard. Um, there's now a lot of new products that are now shipping, of course, with Wi-Fi 6, and you're essentially going to be leaving performance on the floor, where without that Wi-Fi 6 enabled router, you can't really get that benefit. Uh, even things like the PlayStation 5, which comes with Wi-Fi 6, you could be getting lower latency, faster speeds, a better range, and overall just a, a better and safer experience by upgrading to a router. And we'll talk about how even safety comes into play when you upgrade something like your router. So these are going to be underneath our um, our gaming line of routers. So the GS series is kind of a new series. You might not necessarily be aware of them. These are going to be exclusive to Walmart. So do keep that in mind is that you're not going to be finding them at all retailers. Um, we do have a wide range of other great Wi-Fi 6 routers that, of course, you can purchase from all retailers, um, you know, like Newegg and Amazon and many other uh, retailers. But if you're looking specifically for this model, the AX3000 and the AX5400, uh, 5400 on the GS lineup, those are going to be Walmart exclusives. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at these models right here and just show you what we got here. All right. So first one up is going to be uh, the AX3000. So this is going to be a two by two based unit um, supporting, of course, Wi-Fi 6 technology on the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz band right there. You can see it's got a really cool kind of clean design. Uh, with the RGI, some RGB lighting that's right there, of course, your antenna. And then if we flip that to the back, you're going to see that you've got your USB 3 port. You've got four ports, including a dedicated gaming port. And then, of course, your WAN port, reset button, and then an off and on button right there. Um, so overall, standard solid connectivity, but works really well with that dedicated gaming port. Kind of if you're wondering the way that that works is that um, if you take your hardline connected system or if you took a console and you just plugged it straight into that port, it will automatically prioritize that device over any other device in the network. You don't have to go in and set up or manage anything. It just automatically defaults that that is kind of the prioritized port um, that will get 
essentially prioritization across the devices that are attempting to access the router. Now, by default, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a faster um, connected experience for that device. The way that you want to think about it more is that, of course, when you're connecting all the devices to your router, it could be 10 devices, 20 devices, 30 devices. There could be multiple devices that are requesting essentially processing and bandwidth from the router. And so it, having that uh, device being essentially at the top can help to maintain the best kind of experience and best performance and potentially improvement in speed. So that is kind of the main benefit that you would have with that kind of dedicated gaming port. So let's take a closer look at some of kind of the key specifications uh, for the GS, GS AX3000. So uh, it's, uh, like I said, Wi-Fi 6. It is fully backwards compatible with Wi-Fi 5 or a 11 ac so you don't have to worry about that. If you have any older AC-based uh, AC devices, Wi-Fi 5, it's fully backwards compatible. Um, it is fully compatible with the latest generation consoles, so like Xbox, PlayStation 5. Um, it does have a specialized mobile game mode optimization, so if you're playing games on tablets or phones, you do have that. Uh, VPN Fusion we'll talk about, but this is a really cool technology that allows you to essentially have normal internet connection along with your VPN running concurrently on the system, and you can divvy up connections per how you have your VPN set up. And so that's important because sometimes if you want to have an, uh, kind of the, in, the benefits of running a VPN, normally that would be uh, running across all your essentially connected channels, but having the ability to kind of have an, a normal internet connected channel along with a VPN at the same time can actually be really nice because sometimes there can be restrictions or reductions in performance because you are running a VPN. Um, integration, uh, lifetime security under the form of our AI protection technology. Um, gear acceleration essentially just means that kind of you can quickly optimize any device uh, that you have through our software to allow you to kind of make sure that that device is getting the best experience. So that could be like a streaming player. It could be a laptop. It could be a desktop. It could be a phone. It could be any device on your network. Um, and there are also specialized presets for things like media streaming versus gaming where you can optimize an experience. Uh, adaptive QoS and traffic monitoring is really advanced. We can actually monitor all the packets that come through and give you like a full pie graph to let you know how much bandwidth is being used by something like Netflix versus Steam versus websites, and even break that down per all the devices, and you can see where all your bandwidth is being shared. Really, really, really cool. Um, so. Uh, a couple of things is 160 megahertz support. That's important because if you've got a Wi-Fi 6 uh, enabled device, 160 megahertz is going to be kind of the fastest bandwidth channel um, and kind of block that you want to be able to assign to those devices so they get the best speed. But your device has to be able to support 160 megahertz along with the router supporting that. So you want to be able to pair those two together. So you do have that available to you. Um, you can see you've got that cool kind of RGB lighting that's there in the front. It's got this cool kind of slash based design, uh, kind of lose little dots and perforation, kind of has a good um, similar kind of ID to some of our new laptops that have kind of a similar design. There's that gaming port that we talked about. You can see uh, the gear accelerator essentially just allows you to go in through the kind of the system control panel and make optimizations to, like I said, different presets. And you can see that right here, like media streaming, web browsing, file transferring, things along those lines. The choice is kind of up to you. Um, Port forwarding and different types of NAT options. We have NAT, um, NAT port forwarding built into the actual um, software, our ASUS WRT firmware. Um, this can be really advantageous, especially for like consoles, if you're having issues connecting to certain servers, using certain chat or kind of like voice speak functions or things like that, you might have to actually do some port forwarding. And normally that can be a little bit more compl complicated to understand on how to do that with your router and which game. But now you can just literally go into the router, select your game. So you could select like Battlefield or like Apex Legends or Fortnite, and we'll automatically configure all those port, uh, the port forwarding settings for you. Here's the VPN fusion that we talked about, which essentially, like I said, allows you to run VPN directly on board. Um, something you might not think about if we go to the settings as well is going to be a technology uh, with the actual chip. So just like uh, you know, any device has a processor, um, you might not realize, but your older uh, Wi-Fi router might have like an older dual core processor. So it might be like maybe like a couple hundred megahertz, like 200, 400, 600 megahertz. This is a 1.5 gigahertz tri-core processor. So it's much, much faster. Um, the reason why that's important is that um, this with a much higher speed based connection and a technology called multi-user MIMO allows the actual router to really deal with a lot of devices at one time, um, helping to actually maintain much better performance for multiple devices. So the faster the processor, the more kind of specialized features that can be run on the router without kind of affecting the overall performance and being able to handle a wide range of devices at one time. Okay. 
So pretty cool. Um, this also does support our AI mesh technology, which essentially AI mesh is pretty cool in terms of that the main benefit of what you get with AI mesh is that if you want to kind of like pair two of these units together to be able to give you broader coverage, then you could go ahead and do that with AI mesh. So that is pretty cool where you could pair those two. And here about the network security, um, this is actually going to be a technology that we have built in that's stored directly inside the router that you can turn on. And the, the way that essentially this works is that um, it will block access to malicious websites. So essentially, if you click on a link, let's say like in an email or like a text message, and this is a been a known flag server that essentially might be doing data mining or might be doing injection or any number of different things, it'll immediately block access to that server across any device that you're utilizing. So even if you're not running software on that device, it doesn't matter. The router essentially will automatically block you and you can even actually tell it to notify you. So it can actually email you and let you know, hey, we've blocked a malicious attack. Um, you might want to kind of look a little bit more into this. And you don't pay for this. It gets automatically real-time updated um, as long as you have it turned on in the router. OK? So that is going to be uh, AI protection. Uh, for those of you that are parents, we also do advanced kind of parental controls and filtering and all kinds of options there, content filters, website filters, uh, time that you can assign to allow your devices to connect online. That's all available to you. So pretty sweet. Um, so that is going to be the AX3000. Uh, so let's uh, quickly touch on the AX5400, which is kind of going to be the upgraded version, pretty much almost very, very similar to the, um, uh, pretty similar to the AX3000, but it's going to be a little bit different. So let's do a side-by-side -side picture here. And I'll check also if there's anybody that has any questions here. Um, but let me see, yeah, here, AX5400. And we'll do a side-by-side -side photo here. So here we go. So this is the uh, 5400. Yeah. And actually, if we should do it so kind of side by side, they're going to look pretty similar here. The, the picture is a little bit different. But the main difference is one has uh, RGB illumination for the eye, and the other one doesn't have RGB illumination for the eye. Um, but in terms of the inside of the design, um, there's going to be also a little bit of difference. The AX5400 is a 4x4 four four based router as opposed to the 3000, which is going to be a two by two based router. Um, and now what does that mean? Well, the main differential that you're going to have with a four by four means that there's actually four transmit and receive antennas. Um, the reason why that can be important is that when you step over to some Wi-Fi five based devices and when you step over to Wi-Fi six, um, essentially there is going to be something that is called multi-user MIMO. And what multi-user MIMO means is essentially that the router can simultaneously manage and essentially engage with multiple devices at one time. So if you have like a phone, um, a streaming box, a laptop, and a desktop, or you know uh, a permutation of adding like a console in there, or two phones, or whatever you want to have, essentially four devices, it could work with four devices all at one time. Um, in older generations of Wi-Fi standard, it didn't work like that. The multi-user MIMO technology wasn't incorporated. And essentially what the router would have to do is it would treat it sequentially. It would treat one device, and then it go to the next device, the next device, and the next device. It could do it pretty quickly, but it wouldn't be as ideal as being able to serve multiple devices at the same exact time. And so um, when you step over to the AX5400, because it essentially it's a 4x4 versus a 2x2, it essentially just can mean it can potentially serve twice as many devices at the same time. So if you have like a household that might have like 20 to 30 to 40 devices, you would be better off generally with the AX5400 than you would with the 3000, which might be better suited, you know, to a house with like, you know, 10, 15, 25 base devices, right? Um, they're both going to still give you very good range, very good stability, throughput, and a lot of the core features that we've just talked about are going to be fundamentally the same. But if you really kind of want to be able to manage more devices um, in your house, while maintaining kind of the benefit of having good bandwidth for those devices, then the AX54 is going to give you that. So um, let's just quickly take a look at the page for the 5400. And then we've got one more thing to touch on. And we'll kind of go from there, guys. So let me go ahead and jump into that. Um, so here you can see, same thing. This is Wi-Fi 6, um, has all those same key features, 160 megahertz support. Um, but if we actually go over to our key specifications, we're going to see what I was talking about, where this is going to be a 4x4 on the 5 gigahertz, which is going to be key, especially if you've got a Wi-Fi 6-based device, where, like I said, in the um, AX3000, that one is only going to be a 2x2-based device. So that is really kind of be the, I'd say, one of the key differentials. And then, of course, also here, the ID design, where you can see that it's got this still RGB strip, but it also has 
um, kind of some lighting and kind of reflection that's going on there with the RGB, uh, excuse me, with the, the eye, the prismatic kind of effect there that's on the RGB eye. So a little bit of kind of a different aesthetic that's on that model. Okay, um, but otherwise kind of all the same key features and functions, including the AI mesh support and the um, AI protection technology that we talked about there. Um, let me see if I actually, I think I can probably show you a, a cool little video here really quick of how that AI protection works. And then I'll see maybe if anybody's got any quick questions there. So give me one second here. Uh, yep, here we go. Okay, guys. So, so let's show you right here. So, um, yeah, here we go. So here's actually a, a video that we have, guys, if you actually want to check out a little bit of demo of this, uh, but we'll show you right here. If you're actually checking out the video, what you can actually see right there is that right there when I clicked on that link, you'll see that it blocked the page. So you can see right there, there's a little kind of notification that you got on your phone that let you know, hey, that link that you clicked on was a malicious link and it's been blocked. And so this happens on real time. All you need to do is go into the Asus router app, turn on this function, and then any one of the devices that you have in your network, it doesn't matter, will be essentially protected from these uh, sites that could, like I said, have links to ransomware, they could have injection policies, they could have a lot of different kind of things going on there. And these are consistently kind of updated by Trend Micro, uh, who is monitoring kind of these known malicious servers and links that are out there. Um, so again, whether you're kind of using messaging applications, websites, email, this can be really handy. So again, let me just kind of show back, uh, go back and show you what it would look like. This is a test link that is being shown here in this video. But you can see right there when you click on the test link, instead of opening up the web browser, so there would have normally opened up Chrome, it stopped and it blocked that. So that's pretty much how that uh, Trend Micro um, AI protection technology works. Really clean, really easy to be able to benefit from. And again, there's no cost to you. That comes included with the router. Okay, so that is going to be the um, uh, GS AX3000 and the GS AX5400. Price points on those guys is going to be 199 for the 3000, and then it's going to be 249 for the 5400. And you can pick those up right now at Walmart. So if you essentially just kind of head over there, um, I can show you guys here. Um, but if you head over to kind of Walmart, walmart.com, um, you'll actually be able to see these models. Both of them are currently listed. So you can see right there, we do have the uh, AX3000 uh, that's available. And same thing, if you went ahead and switched over to the AX5400, uh, you'd be able to pick that model up as well. So those are going to be our brand new additions that we have in terms of kind of Wi-Fi 6 gaming-centric routers for you guys. Okay, great. Um, so that covers us there. Um, let me actually just see if... Uh, there's a kind of any questions that we say there. Uh, hey, so uh, Brandon, you were asking about if essentially we had um, 2.5G connectivity. There is actually 2.5G connectivity on that PN51. Uh, the actual one model does come with 2.5G connectivity. So we uh, do have you covered there. Like I said, depending on the specification configuration, you either have 1.5, excuse me, a one gigabit, or 2.5 gigabit connectivity. And also for like systems that you do want to be able to upgrade to 2.5 gig connectivity, then um, we also do have a USB adapter that we recently launched, which actually allows you to have 2.5 gig. Now, if your question was in relation to routers, we also do have actually a router that does have 2.5G connectivity. Um, so that is going to be uh, our AX86U. Uh, so actually, let me go ahead and bring that up for you. If you're kind of looking for a model that might have 2.5G connections, we do got you covered there. So um, I can show you quickly that model as well. So this model is also already available. You're gonna pay a little bit more. This is even gonna be a higher performing base model, but this right here is the AX5700 and the 5700 will actually give you um, a 2.5 gigabit based connection. So if you wanted to pair that again with the 2.5 gigabit based device, um, then you would have that. And there's also going to be some uh, some more premium functions and features and even a higher level of performance that's going to be on this model. But if we switch over here to the tech, tech specifications, you'll see that this is even a higher performing unit. It's a 3 by 3 base 2.4 and a 4 by 4 base uh, 5 gigahertz. So this is actually going to have even faster throughput speeds, better range, um, and it's also a more advanced processor. You can see this is a 1.8 gigahertz quad core processor. Um, so this is really going to be well suited for those of you that really care about speeds. Okay. 
So hopefully that answers your question there. Um, so uh, Stefan uh, had a question is that what cooler size do I need for a Core i9 11th, 11th gen series processor? Um, it actually, you don't really need to kind of be super stressed about that. Um, you know, that actually brings us to probably here, the other uh, item that I was saying, maybe I'll tease off, which is going to be this guy right here, which is going to be one of our brand new AIO coolers. And this is going to be the Ryu Gen 2. Um, this is a really kind of be kind of an, a next gen kind of really impressive uh, cooling solution. This is first time I've actually unboxed it. Um, first time I've actually gotten hands with it. But, um, you know, for purposes of our discussion, let's actually go ahead and kind of take a look at this here. But um, when you kind of talk about cooling the processor, the thing that kind of sometimes is lost amongst kind of certain people is going to be that your settings really affect the overall cooling requirements. So what I mean by that is that in many situations, when you talk about cooling the processor, you might actually readily be able to cool the processor with no problems with just a good quality power heatsink. So a uh, tower heatsink from like a uh, Cooler Master Hyper 212 or a Noctua U12S. Um, you know, you could spend, you know, 20, uh, excuse me, you know, uh, like 30 to $50 on the cooler and that would cool the processor, no problems, even a Core i9. The difference is, is that if you take advantage of certain technologies like Intel ABT um, or take advantage of MCE or of course our AIOC, um, auto overclocking technology, you could significantly increase the power consumption and the heat output of the CPU, um, you know, by 50 watts, by 100 watts, even more than that. And that can really actually cause you then to have to have a much higher performing cooling solution to be able to take care of the processor. So the first thing kind of you have to really understand is, do you want to kind of run it closer to a stock level of performance, just kind of out of box what Intel advocates for the kind of just general system performance, or are you looking to get kind of the highest level of performance? In most situations, though, for most users, the base recommendation that I would have would be a good quality 240 millimeter AIO would be more than enough uh, for uh, a Core i5, a Core i7, and even a Core i9. Um, with something like here, what you're going to have with um, the Ryujin 2, which this is going to be a 360 millimeter AIO. So you can see a very large radiator where you could have three fans. Um, this is our XF120 fan, but it will actually come with high quality Noctua fans inside the box, but three fans and this larger radiator. It's not so much that the cooling performance is going to be significantly higher with the 360 AIO. You do get a little bit of an improvement in thermal performance, but generally these will operate a little bit of a quieter temperature because there's a little bit more displacement going on. Um, the Ryujin is also going to be special because this pump housing right here um, course has an integrated uh, 3.5 inch LCD screen. So you can actually put in your own kind of images. Uh, you could have real time values coming in for A to 64 or Armor Crate software. You can see things like temperature, fan speed, voltages, clock frequencies, all kinds of things. But um, there's actually an integrated fan that's in here. So if I remove the pump cover, you can actually see that there's a VRM fan right here. And this VRM fan, uh, there's vents here where you can see there's vents, right? And those vents, will exhaust air around to the surrounding portion of the motherboard. So if we take a look at something like here, like we've got a motherboard, here you've got your VRM assembly, you'll actually get that airflow passing across those components to help to bring down the actual VRM temperatures. In reality, is that critical? No, because especially on our higher end boards, the VRM components and the, the heat sinks um, can readily handle essentially the temperature requirements, whether it's gonna be under idle or kind of heavy loads, um, or overclock configurations, but if you're kind of really critical and really want the best cooling performance, then that uh, is going to kind of be something that you're going to want to keep in mind. But um, let me go ahead and uh, just kind of show you here my base recommendation for kind of the cooler that I would uh, recommend uh, for you if you're kind of looking for a good quality cooler. Keep in mind that we do have actually some coolers that will be uh, launching here in the not too distant future um, for uh, uh, for a wide range of kind of CPUs. So um, I would say you could take a look at our ROG Strix LC coolers, which we offer and black and in white. So um, that will take care of you. So let me go ahead and see if I can pull that up here. Got it right here, man. So this would be um, the cooler right here. Yeah, ROG Strix uh, 240. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Actually, hold on. Let me change that page there, guys, and get that loaded up for you. There we go. 
So this would be the Strix LC2. Uh, this is our new version that's going to be coming out shortly. We do already have some models available. And like I said, you can get this in black or you can get this in white um, um, and you'd be good to go. And if, like I said, you want to save a little bit of money, we also do offer the tough gaming version of this. Um, so both of those would be great choices for you in terms of kind of a, a cooler for Core i9 based um, setup. All right. Uh, let me see, see right here. So Brandon, as far as kind of your question about multiple 2.5, that's a little bit more complicated because it really depends on the switches that get incorporated within the router. That can add quite a bit of complexity and cost into the router. And the kind of demand and requirement really isn't that strong uh, for that at this stage because still 2.5 gigabit is kind of in its infancy. We are kind of evaluating that, but I would say that for most users, what would probably make more sense there is that we do have switches that are available um, where if the user did want multiple high-speed based connections, then that is an option. But definitely as we progress forward, you know, we were the first to kind of really introduce 10G, 2.5G, um, Wi-Fi 6, and so many of these high-end standards um, onto kind of these routers. So definitely, you know, as we continue to look forward, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to incorporate more of these high-speed based connections on these devices, especially because we've really been at the forefront of incorporating these on things like motherboards, um, you know, laptops, mini PCs, so many other devices, right? But we kind of have to proportionally roll out those specifications while they make sense at times, right? So um, let me just see right here. Um, yeah, so Kevin makes a point right there. He says where he's got a Hyper 212 with my Core i9. That's 100%, like I said, and entirely OK. A lot of people will over kind of spend on the cooler requirement. And especially if you're going to run that Core i9, um, like I said, just for general game workloads, and you don't have kind of like the advanced MCT, uh, MCE or ABT modes enabled on that. You just essentially have an F5 defaults, even with something like your XMP enabled for your DRAM. You can comfortably run a tower heatsink and your temperatures will be fine. Um, yeah, switch model. So uh, let me see here. Let me see if I can bring it up right here. This actually, the switch model that we have would be a 10G, but of course it can work in 2.5G. Uh, but let me go ahead and bring that up for you. And this model is already available. So see if I can bring it up here. Yeah. Yes. All right, loading it up for you here, man. Yeah, so it's going to be the XGU208. Uh, which is one option. And like I said, we've got a couple other options that will be available in the not too distant future. So um, let me go ahead and lastly, like I said, finish kind of just showing off a little bit here with this Ryujin 2 before we wrap things up, guys. Um, again, we're going to do a full uh, live stream on this um, on this cooler. So I don't, I don't want to take up uh, you know too much to show you guys everything about it, but we just kind of want to show some cool things off here uh, with this brand new cooler that we will be launching here. So let me go ahead and just bring this up here. So for guys that haven't seen this, this is the brand new Ryujin 2 360. Um, you can see the kind of the, the big claim to fame right there is going to be that 3.5 inch screen that we have on the unit. That is really kind of going to be the key hallmark that is on this along with the VRM assist fan and the inclusion of the uh, IPPC Noctua base fans. But we've got the cooler right here. So let's actually show it to you in person. So um, I can actually go ahead and Put this on secondary B cam. You guys can check a couple little cool little kind of just teaser shots here for you guys um, as we get into it. So you'll actually see right here. Let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, here you can see this is the actual housing assembly. This is the 3.5 inch screen, really nice kind of squared off assembly. You can see there the sides for the fans. That is the actual inside right there you can of course see your black cabling that you'll need to be able to connect everything you've got your usb which will be connected to the motherboard and then uh, your micro usb right there they'll also need to be connected okay uh, you can see nice nice little rg accents right there and of course those are the vents that you're going to need uh, for this guy right here which is going to be the VRM assist fan. So this is the fan uh, that will help to provide the airflow to essentially your corresponding VRM components. You can see that nice little magnetic connector right there. It's in place. Um, of course, you're going to have pre-applied thermal compound. This does use the brand new um, seventh generation pump uh, as opposed to the prior sixth generation paint pump there. So it's even quieter. I've uh, been tuned to tighter tolerance, very, very good efficiency. 
nice braided cable, which is uh, flexible and nicely sleeved right there on the unit. I can go ahead and pop this back on here. You can see how it just mounts right there. The other big difference too is that, let me see if I can uh, try to kind of position this here. But in the prior generation, one of the kind of challenges is that the mounting uh, kind of configuration was that you see that the cables, um, they don't obstruct with the DRAM anymore. So in the prior generation, the actual cables came out to the side, and so they might bump up or be pressed right up against the DRAM, which could make installation uh, more complicated. But you can see right there, it mounts actually to the bottom. And so that actually can make the installation process more streamlined and easier um, so that you have less issues. So that is kind of a revision that we went ahead and implemented then with the Ryugen 2. Um, let me actually see, lastly, if we've got one of the other cool things, which is inside this guy. Um, let me give me a second here is I think it should be in this box. But one of the really cool things that also comes inside this guy is going to be that it comes with a new ARGB controller. And that's what I think is really cool. Oh, yeah, I can show you this, guys. This is one really cool part is that it comes with the Noctua IPPC vet fans. Oh, there it is. I think I found it. OK, very cool. Live unboxing, guys. I literally just got this in. So this is going to be for our upcoming live stream where we're going to be covering uh, the new Tough Gaming LC cooler, the new Ryugen 2, um, and the, uh, the Strix LC2 uh, 240 and 280 coolers. So all four of the new coolers that we're coming out with. So bam, look at that. There we go. Look at that, look at that beautiful Noctua fan. This is their IPPC based fans. Um, very high performance, extremely high quality, outstanding strat static pressure performance. So you get three of these Noctua fans that are all black included with the actual Ryogen uh, cooler, both in the 240 millimeter and in the 360 millimeter version. So really, really nice fan offering that you have right there. Hey Brandon, it does not actually have a, um, a refill port. Uh, these are essentially sealed. Um, the actual uh, seventh generation pumps, um, they actually go through a very high level of validation, including actually specialized leak testing that's actually done to be able to ensure that you have outstanding performance in terms of the lifespan, which is the reason why these units come with extensive six-year six warranty um, that's present on them, but they are not kind of default designed essentially for end user serviceability. So uh, compared to like a traditional open uh, or custom loop water cooling configuration where users would essentially kind of drain or refill. Um, that's not something you have to kind of worry about, OK? So let's go ahead and show you this kind of last little teaser right here. This is pretty cool. Ooh, here we go. Look at look at this, guys. This is pretty nice. So let me let me show you right here. Here we go. Let me see if I can take a little bit of this off so it doesn't look so uh, shiny on the stream here. OK. There we go. So that is uh, very nice. Actually, I did not know that it was going to be metal. Uh, so this is a really nice metal-based housing uh, for the um, the actual controller. So this is uh, the controller that will come included with the Ryujin uh, 240 and 360. So you're going to have three additional ARGB ports that will be on here. Okay. Uh, and then you are going to have um, actually, you know, I think it's four if I remember the documentation. Yes, actually three ARGB ports, and then a fourth ARGB port, and then three fan headers, and then um, another essentially fan header. So you're essentially going to have all of those. And there's your ARGB in, which feeds out. So essentially, this is kind of like a large splitter uh, uh, controller that you have right here, and then that set of power along with the micro USB. So this is that four port controller. So let's go ahead and just take a little bit of a closer look on the secondary cam for you guys. And again, this is for the brand new uh, Ryugen 2 360. Oh, let me go ahead and get this in the shot for you guys. So here you guys go. You can see this is the nice housing, all in aluminum right there. There you can see you've got one, two, three, uh, four PWM uh, connections right there. There's three, and then the fourth one is right there. So you get it in opposite sides. And then you've got your three ARGB ports right there, and then another ARGB port right there. 
So that is going to come included um, and very, very nice addition to the cooler. Your ARGB in, SATA, and then micro USB, which you're going to need to, of course, connect uh, to the motherboard. So overall, really cool. Uh, hey, David. Uh, so uh, what stream is this? If you're wondering about, this is our weekly PC DIY stream. So we cover actually all kinds of new things on this stream. Um, I just went ahead and decided to throw in a little bit of a unique, a new introduction here for the brand new upcoming Ryogen 2, which is one of our brand new AIO coolers, which is coming out with a 3.5 inch LCD integrated VRM cooler, Noctua, um, IPPC fans, and of course, this really cool um, multi-port ARGB and fan controller. But uh, in this stream, essentially, we talk about all kinds of stuff. We showcase users' builds. We talk about UEFI updates and BIOS, tweaking and tuning guides, performance demo demonstrations, um, answer Q&A. And uh, in this stream alone, we've covered actually quite a number of different updates. We talked about actually two new monitors, some new routers, a new mini PC, um, new X570 series motherboards. Actually, did I, I talk about that at the very beginning? I think I talked about that, right, guys? If I if I didn't, that's a that's a really big update that we've got. We've got actually some new X570 series motherboards that are going to be coming out. I know a lot of people were super excited about the dark here when it came out because um, it actually had a passive uh, chipset based design. And if you didn't know, now you know. In the not too distant future, I'm going to be giving you guys some insight about a brand new series of X570 series motherboards, which are going to feature passive chipset cooling along with some other cool updates. So we're going to have some new updates specifically for the ROG lineup and maybe some other motherboards. Can't tell you everything because you're going to have to make sure to keep it tuned to the PC DIY Facebook group. Or if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button and follow us here or make sure to follow us on our social media channels so you guys can find out. But in the not too distant future, in Q3, we will have some brand new X570 passively cooled uh, base motherboards. So some pretty cool stuff there. So hopefully that answers your question right there, man. Um, and we'll get you. Uh, hey, James. Yeah, if you're looking for RGB, make sure to really check out our next stream uh, that will be coming out in the not too distant future. We've got ARGB um, on all of our coolers. So we've got the Ryujin 2, um, which is pretty much all black and really clean, not really focused for RGB. But we do have um, other models like our Strix LC2 series coolers, um, which are going to give you really, really cool RGB lighting effects on the actual pump housing itself, along with ARGB fans. So we'll have the Tough Gaming. Uh, RGB cooler, and we'll have the ROG Strix RGB cooler, which comes in white and in black, okay? Um, and we've got quite a number of other offerings. So we'll have uh, everything from 240 to 240 to 280 to 360. So, you know, kind of an entire range along, of course, with uh, the latest generation 7th gen pump-based design. So we're definitely going to have you covered there if you're looking for kind of AI coolers. Uh, sorry, Brand, I can't really kind of comment on laptops. We're focusing really here on these streams on our PC DIY, so our component series products. Um, so no real kind of information on our SBG series products. Um, it is always a challenge when it comes to kind of having the same type of distribution channels in the US as we do in Canada, and we strive to work with our channel partners at pushing out availability. Part of it sometimes is just, uh, you know, uh, bandwidth in terms of production quantity and also kind of demand or availability uh, in, in different kind of countries and different regions and accounting for kind of a lot of kind of different factors when it comes to logistics and rollout and, um, you know, kind of everything that kind of comes along with that. But definitely, we are always consistently looking to try to be able to push out as much inventory across North America for our US customers and our Canadian customers. Um, and that will continue to kind of be the case. And in the not too distant future, we'll also in later in 2021, we're hoping to actually launch a revamped um, Asus eStore, which will actually better serve our Canadian customers um, so that you'll be able to actually purchase directly from Asus as opposed to um, having to go to, you know, um, a third party site if that is something that you're interested in. So definitely make sure to keep it tuned here for more of that kind of information as we get closer to that launch of that kind of uh, revised uh, uh, website. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, so I think that probably covers. Um, so uh, David has a question here in terms of the Asus EKWB. Um, I will double check on this. Uh, make sure to actually check our um, the post in our PCDIY Facebook group, but I will double check with our product manager. Actually, I do believe that uh, for the Asus EKWB card, that card we are no longer going to be having actively in terms of production. Um, so um, if you are going to uh, be looking for a card as it's kind of going to continue to be refreshed in terms of active availability, you are going to want to be looking at, you know, um, any one of the other cards that we have within our Asus uh, series lineup. So that's going to be our KO series. That's going to be our dual series. 
um, our Tough Gaming series or our ROG Strix series. And both the Tough Gaming series and the ROG Strix series do have extensive water block support from partners. So whether you're talking about, you know, like Bits Power, Alpha Cool, um, excuse me, Thermal Take, EK, um, many partners. We have tons of partners that have water block support for those cards um, so that if you're looking to be able to water cool a card, then that is going to be a great option for you. We know that a lot of people really loved the option in terms of having the Asus EKWB cards. And as always, uh, EK has really been a fantastic partner with us in terms of kind of collaborating on specialized products. And it was really nice to be able to offer a card that offered um, kind of a streamlined experience in terms of just being right out of the box. Um, everything was produced, ready uh, to go in terms of being able to integrate into your loop. I do wanna make one note that here that for our North American customers that may not be aware, um, actually installing a water block onto your graphics card does not void your warranty. Some people have a misconception regarding that. Now, as always, we of course won't cover any type of inadvertent, direct or accidental damage that might occur to the card in terms of you installing the water block, but you actually just removing the original factory uh, cooling solution on the card and then putting in a water block will not invalidate your warranty. Your warranty is still intact. Um, it will still be, of course, ultimately dependent on review by a service and support team if you send it in for an RMA under the standard three-year warranty guideline. Um, and the card will have to be returned in a factory condition, meaning that you do have to reinstall the factory original cooling solution. You can't send it in essentially with the water block in place. Um, so that is important to understand. But um, as long as essentially there is no inadvertent um, direct or accidental damage that's occurred to the card, your warranty is essentially maintained. Um, assuming, like I said, other criteria that is applicable to warranty coverage is also met. All right, guys. So um, see if there's any kind of lasting questions there. If not, I think we'll get ready to kind of wrap those up. Yes, uh, you are correct. Uh, that the, e the Asus EKWB card does really have that fantastic design because it's a true kind of one slot slim and very compact card. It was actually one of those compact designs uh, that was out there. Uh, but you know, ultimately in terms of trying to help to ensure the best production output and being able to get as many cards out as we can to our users in relation to that, um, then as of right now, like I said, it's currently not a card that is going to continue to actively be available within uh, the North American region. So um, if there's any kind of updates or changes, of course, we will make sure to edify and let you guys know. And that's one of the reasons why you guys want to be part of our PCDIY Facebook group um, or, of course, be subscribed to checking out our weekly PCDI streams where we give you guys updates on types of any hardware releases or anything along those lines. OK, guys? Um, yeah, so Hunter, uh, glad to know that that information helps you out. And uh, so you can definitely, like I said, feel confident that if you do go ahead and, like I said, service a card, if you clean out the, you know, the, uh, the, the card's physical fan assembly, or if you replace the water block or anything like that, it does not void your warranty. So you're okay. But again, like I said, you still have to be mindful of uh, the warranty criteria and guidelines. And ultimately, it is still subject to review by our service and support team once they receive the card. Okay. All right, guys. Um, so... That's pretty much everything that we have here for this stream. Um, sadly, this week, I don't have our PC DIY builders a spotlight in effect to be able to go ahead and dive into and be able to show you guys some of the awesome builds that you guys have contributed to the PC DIY community. But with that, what I would do is I will quickly show you the link in the PC DIY Facebook group so that if you guys want to submit your builds for a future kind of a, a spotlight within, um, um, excuse me, within the PC DIY stream, then you guys can definitely make sure to submit your build. And we'd, I'd love for you to be able to kind of show it off. So normally as part of our weekly streams here, we do love to show off at least, you know, probably like seven to 10 builds, um, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. It kind of just depends on how many submissions we get, how many uh, ones that I've had the time to kind of curate and go through. But um, all you need to do to get featured, it can be a new system. It can be an old system. It doesn't matter. It can be a small form factor system. It can be a hard line system. It could be an air cold system. It could be one that you've built for gaming or it could be one that you're doing with a media server or it could just be for an everyday box. It doesn't matter. Um, we don't care. I'm just looking to be able to show off what you guys have done when it comes to putting together uh, build utilizing some ASUS hardware. So what do you need to do? All you need to do is just head over to our PC DIY uh, Facebook group and I will give you the guys uh, the link here and I will show you uh, where you can go in terms of the submission form and uh, all you're going to need to do. So give me one second here and I will show it to you guys. So here is our PC DIY Facebook group. Um, I will put the link here in the chat for you guys. And uh, just head over to announcements, or you can go ahead and look it up as well. 
Here you can see actually this was our UEFI updates that we release on a weekly basis. We show you actually uh, the chipsets uh, that have been updated. I give you guys re full release note information. You can see right here all the different models that we have released the UEFI update for. Here was our teaser announcement on that we have some new X570 passively cooled chipset motherboards coming out. Really awesome build that's going to be featured by GPEX here for an upcoming stream. So make sure to check that out. Uh, but if we scroll down here, we'll actually see here our PCDIY Builder Spotlight submission link. And uh, sorry, it should be up here in a moment. And you can actually just search for this as well. I could have searched for it, guys. This is actually the, those ARGB coolers that we have coming out, uh, the new uh, Strix LC2 series. This is uh, actually something that's cool for you guys don't know. We have this product tracker. The product tracker actually has unlisted uh, products that have not yet been released, but we have kind of information that I compiled together for you guys to be able to click into and find out when those products are going to be available and any information that we have that I try to update on a weekly basis. But here you can see we have our PC DIY Builder Spotlight. You just click on this uh, form link um, and then just fill out the corresponding information for your build, upload some photos, and then from there, it will get featured in the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. So definitely not too hard, guys. So with that, thanks for checking out the stream, guys. Take care, take it easy, enjoy the rest of your day, have a safe and healthy Friday, and uh, enjoy your guys' weekend. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy, and best of luck with your guys' builds. Take